started. So uh, my name is Bian Webster, and uh, this is uh, the, the uh, Compiling Android with LLVM talk. Uh, I'm the, uh, the project lead on the LLVM Linux project, and we're just going to talk about, uh, about using LLVM when it comes to Android. So the original idea of this talk came about in, in January, and uh, uh, I was hoping that I'd have lots of time to be able to get all of Android recompiled with LLVM in time for this talk. Unfortunately, real life got in the way, and uh, I had a lot of other things to do with the actual project itself, and so I went as far as I possibly could in this particular endeavor uh, uh, before Android Builder started. And in fact, I was working on this until actually I almost got on the plane so what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at what I was able to get done in this time frame and then talk about the kinds of problems that uh, uh, I started to have and the kinds of issues that are there in order to get Android fully compiled with LVM going forward. So the first question I'm always asked when it comes to uh, using Clang on Linux, and specifically for the Linux kernel, is why would you want to uh, bother, right? We have a perfectly good tool chain, GCC, it's all good. Why would you want to use Clang and LLVM? And there's a couple of good reasons for it. The first one is it's a, a fast-moving target. So not all toolchain projects move quickly. In fact, uh, the, the, some other uh, incumbent kinds of tools, they tend to have a, a slower uh, term for, t for uh, uh, changes to get in. And that's just the nature of the kind of technology and the, and the breadth and so on and so forth. It's, it's just the way things have happened. Uh, in the case of LLVM and Clang, it's, it's a relatively new project. Uh, there's an awful lot of people uh, working on it. Uh, the source code is very easy to follow, uh, much more modern uh, architecture and design. The, uh, the community around this particular project, very open, very friendly, very helpful. They're always there to uh, answer questions. And uh, the thing that's nice is, is that uh, uh, in just a couple of years, LLVM and Clang have actually got to the point where they're rivaling what's possible with other traditional tool chains. So there's actually quite a lot of value there. And the great thing is, is although it's actually not necessarily faster uh, when it comes to the resulting uh, binaries that come out of Clang, uh, very similar in size and uh, in speed. Okay, so we're not saying it's faster. It's, it's usually just a tiny bit slower right now. Uh, there are a, f a few situations where Clang actually does faster thing, but they're all very, very similar, statistically pretty close to being the same. One of the really nice things, however, though, is, is that Clang is actually considerably faster than uh, other tools like GCC when it comes to actually compiling. So as we all know, there's, there's the coding, compile, download to your target, testing, debug loop that you do. If you could actually cut down your compile times, that loop starts getting a lot tighter and a lot faster. And uh, that's something that, that makes uh, your life as a developer considerably easier. The other thing that's really nice about uh, LLVM and Clang in general is it's based around LLVM, which is a toolkit. It's a toolkit for building tools. And uh, it started off as basically a, a set of libraries, and then the other tools were built on top of that. But what that means ultimately is, is that you can reuse a lot of those same sorts of core technologies in other kinds of tools to build other sorts of things. Uh, so traditionally, things like compilers were built, linkers, uh, JITs, and so on. Uh, you can also, of course, build executables uh, with back-end code generators, uh, virtual machines. LLVM, after all, stands for low-level virtual machine. But there's also other things, such, such as sort, uh, source code uh, analysis tools. Right? In a lot of situations, uh, you have uh, static analyzers and so on and so forth. One of the things you have to do to build those tools is you start off by building a parser and a whole grammar and so on and so forth. But that's done in parallel to your other tools, like your compiler, and so on and so forth. When it comes to the static analyzer that's part of this particular tool, it actually uses the same parser, the same grammar as the compiler itself. And so you can actually only have to make your change once when you uh, change C standards and what have you. And the other thing that's really nice about it is you don't just have to do it around code. Uh, one of the things I was told about just before I, I came here actually was, in fact, somebody has actually written a Doxygen-like tool that uses LLVM. So what it actually does is it uses the parser that, that uh, is used for Clang, but instead of extracting the source code, what it does is it extracts the comments, associates it with the symbols that are around it, and spits out documentation that way. Again, it's a matter of reusing the same parser. And so you have a much tighter control of how things are, are uh, tied back into the code itself. 
The other one isn't one that I necessarily thought of because, of course, you know, I, I tend to work on one section of, of uh, the product at a time. But when it comes to a, a larger company, um, you're using a toolchain across a lot of different kinds of domains, whether it's the actual uh, parts themselves, you know, DSP, GPU, CPU, different parts of the toolchain like the JIT and so on and so forth. Um, it's nice to have a single tool across all those different domains. Uh, at that point, basically, your, your experience is, is good across the different code bases like uh, the DSP that runs the camera, your audio subsystem, your video on your GPU. Uh, there's things like CUDA, which is based on LLVM. RenderScript on Android. You guys, of course, know what that is. I don't have to explain RenderScript, but RenderScript is actually using LLVM at the back end to take the code that is compiled with RenderScript through a, a JIT at the last minute to be able to run that on the GPU. Right, so all those dynamic uh, animated backgrounds on, on Android are actually running on the GPU and not the CPU. The CPU can actually go to sleep to a large degree. Uh, also, of course, there's actually the, uh, whatever the user space is, in this case Android, uh, applications, and then, of course, like I said before, you can actually do document generation using some of the similar kinds of tools. The reason why this is useful is if you're a company and you want to extend the compiler in a particular way, uh, or, or add extra, extra features that can be used, all of a sudden uh, the, com the extension only has to be written once and it works across all of these different domains. Right? You don't have to actually figure out how to do it on your DSP versus your GPU versus your CPU. Same uh, extension can basically run in all those areas. And uh, this is very important because when it comes to actually developing those, that code, it takes time, testing takes time, uh, and then of course there's qualifying it to actually send it out the door. And this makes all this take a whole lot less uh, effort if it's the same backend tool chain uh, libraries. The next one is, of course, license. And, of course, there's always the whole GPL versus BSD thing. Uh, LLVM is actually licensed explicitly under the UIUC BSD style license. It means, ultimately, things like LLVM technology can be included directly within your product. Uh, so in, in non-GPL code, you can actually include it, whether it's free open stuff or whether it's proprietary stuff, you can actually use the same technology. It means you can extend it in either open or proprietary ways. Of course, we would probably all prefer open ways, but that's not always an option, uh, certainly in mobile. And um, the other thing that's really nice about this is because it's used not only in the open and free areas, it's also used in proprietary areas, it means you actually have a much wider development audience. You've got a lot more people adding to it, extending it, making it better. And in fact, there's actually quite a few people that their day job, their paid day job, is in fact to work on LLVM for their particular uh, uh, employer, whether it be uh, uh, companies like Google, Intel, and so on, uh, or uh, different uh, silicon vendors, uh, mobile event vendors. And then, of course, of course, you probably all know Clang is used very heavily by companies like Apple. So it even goes across, across uh, industries. And I think it's actually pretty cool that, uh, that uh, the, the people who are really wanting to make iOS development better are paying to make a tool chain that works better in, in the Linux and the Android environment. I think that's a, a pretty sweet deal. The other thing is that used to be pretty unique to uh, Clang is you had, the, you had better error messages. You had basically error messages that told you exactly what the problem was and usually told you how to, fi to fix it. So they were called fix-it hints. And in Clang, you actually get color syntax highlighting, so you can see how this stuff works. The reality is, though, we used to say that this was unique to Clang. In fact, the latest versions of GCC have caught up. They do very, very similar things now. And uh, GCC 4.8, there's actually a comparison on the, on the GCC website comparing the latest version of Clang to the latest version of GCC. In fact, GCC is almost entirely caught up, and in some cases, uh, in certain errors, it actually does a, a better job. But in general, one of the nice things is that you can actually see how competition between the different tool chains has actually led to a situation where both tool chains are getting better as they compete with each other. So that's pretty exciting. The next one that's pretty good is that uh, uh, the uh, LLVM toolkit in, 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 um, actually has a, a static analyzer that's built in. It's called Checker. And what happens is you run your make environment under uh, Checker, and what you ultimately get out is a series of HTML files. And those HTML files will ultimately show you all the different paths through your code that may be a problem. And in this particular case, you can see the example where 
if you go through the, uh, the top there, we're using opt-arg in this particular example, uh, if you go to a situation where opt-arg is null, you will fall through into the else portion of that if statement. You'll then go through the switch, and in this particular case, it's, uh, it's uh, set to, uh, to T, your opt is set to T, and when you get down into the code at the bottom, you end up calling uh, string to lang with opt-arg being null. That's a problem. It's not immediately obvious when you look at your code, but Checker can find this and show how these things work. So, relatively simple example. However, the nice thing is, is that Checker, like everything else in LLVM, is expandable. So, whereas it ships with code that allows you to uh, de uh, debug, uh, for instance, malloc and free kinds of issues, uh, it'll actually figure out where you're not freeing memory, where you're leaking memory. It's the kind of thing that you could basically extend, and in fact, people have extended it to work with uh, kmalloc and kfree, for instance, to work within the, the kernel code, for instance. So there's some pretty exciting things you can do there. Other thing that's pretty nice is uh, companies such as Google have actually taken it to a whole new level. There's a really great talk given, uh, that was given at uh, one of the, uh, the conferences a little while ago uh, for LLVM, and in fact, they're actually using LLVM to parse out uh, all their code in their compile farm to actually look for bugs. And so they're using the, the uh, parser to actually figure out how things are, are, are working, looking for common bugs and common errors and situations where APIs change. And then they're actually using the back end to actually rewrite their C++ code. So they're compiling code into code such that if it, if it changes, they can send an email back to the developer developer can see the new code, figure out whether it's better, whether it actually solves the problem, and then it can be checked back in again. So, you know, wouldn't it be great if you had a mechanism where you could basically uh, fix common errors without having to do as much work as you would have to do if you did it completely manually? The next thing is uh, Clang and LVM are already used in a lot of different projects. Of course, it's already used in Android as far as uh, render script is concerned. It works on ARM, MIPS, and x86. LLVM is used very heavily in uh, image processing and on GPU code, things like LLVM pipe driver, Clover for OpenC OpenCL and so on. And it's also used in a lot of situations for shader optimizers and so on on various GPUs. Uh, other things like the Debian project, Sylvester LeDrew, part of the Debian project, is actually regularly rebuilds the whole of the Debian archive with Clang to see how things are, are working. And in fact, it seems to hover around 10%. So about 10% of the packages don't build. They, they break on, on build, but the rest of the packages build just fine and work great. So we're actually getting to a point where this stuff works pretty well. The ironic thing is between version 3.1 and 3.2 of LLVM, the number of packages that failed to compile actually went up. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of bugs got fixed in upstream code, and so the percentage should have come down. LLVM, they'll started to complain about more and more warnings and errors, and as a result, packages that used to work actually started to break again. But the neat thing is, is that it's still hovering roughly around 10%. So again, LLVM is, uh, includes a whole tool chain. There's a C, C++, Objective-C compiler. Uh, you've probably heard of lib C++. It's a alternative uh, C++ library that came out of the same uh, project. Uh, it's something that's also being uh, compiled into a lot of different projects. There's a static analyzer I talked about. Uh, there's also, it's a, it's a pretty new project, but there's LLDB, so it's a debugger, specifically uh, using the same kinds of technologies, a replacement for, uh, for the use of GDB. And then there's a number of different linkers that are being worked on. Uh, MC Linker is the embedded version. It's the linker that's meant to run on the actual platform itself, and LDD. Now, the last two the last two uh, line items there are relatively uh, new. Uh, the, the reality is, is that right now, certainly for the development that I do, I still use GDB, and I actually still use the, uh, the GNU linker because these, these uh, projects still aren't necessarily at the level that they need to be at for the, the work that I do, unfortunately. The neat thing, however, though, is that Clang as a C compiler is actually already being shipped commercially in a couple different areas. Uh, obviously, it's being shipped as part of Xcode from Apple, but it's also now being shipped as part of the NDK for Android. And in fact, uh, the, the last drop of, uh, of Android had that in there, and it, there's been a couple of really good articles about it. But uh, Clang is being used in a lot of different situations uh, to where it produces more optimal code and more optimal situations. It's being 
basically used instead of uh, other options. The really cool thing is, is uh, basically GCC has, has actually gotten a lot better over the last couple of years in direct competition with Clang. We used to have a whole bunch of different slides that we gave showing how Clang could outperform GCC when it came to developer experience. And the reality is, is that GCC does all the same sorts of things now. Things like macro expansion, better error reporting. It actually does do fix-it hints now as well. And the address sanitizer that was added to uh, Clang, which actually looks for potential address addressing problems ahead of time, that was actually added concurrently to GCC. Uh, basically, the developers all work together to make that work. So we're actually seeing positive change on all of our tools uh, through competition between these two different tool chains, which is really neat. Now, most of the time I spend during the day is actually on uh, the LLVM Linux project. Like I said, I'm the project lead there. And uh, the whole point of this particular project is to uh, basically sit between the kernel community and the LLVM community and actually get one code base to work with the other. We want to be able to develop the Linux kernel within LLVM and not just on GCC. Uh, so we spend a lot of time figuring out potential problems, uh, issues that prevent that from working, and uh, we maintain a series of patches that we try to upstream as best we can to both projects. And uh, the big thing is we're, we try to concentrate all the different people. There was a, a number of different org people and organizations working on this. It's a matter of bringing them all together so we're all getting the work done faster and helping each other out. If you want to learn more about it, there we've got a, 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 a wiki web page. It's got information about our bugs that we found, uh, roadmap, project status, all that sort of stuff. There's documentation, how-tos, and all that sort of thing on how to, how to uh, build stuff. However, if you actually want to use our code itself, we've got a Git repo. And bear in mind, we don't actually maintain our own versions of the Linux kernel and LLVM. We maintain patches uh, and an automated toolkit that basically allows you to uh, check out our code, type make, it downloads patches and installs LLVM and Clang. Uh, it downloads all the, the tool chains that we need extra beyond that. Linux kernel code, and then finally QMU and a bunch of different test tools to make sure that what we've ultimately done uh, works properly. So like I said, we actually maintain a whole bunch of patches. Our patch management is primarily done using Quilt, and the reason is, is because the underlying version control system, although usually Git isn't necessarily always, some of the uh, code bases are actually subversion. And uh, we also do things like like I said before, we, we still have to use some parts of the GCC tool chain uh, for our cross situations for ARM, for instance, which is what I spend most of my time on. Uh, we actually have a choice of backend tool chain. And uh, when it comes to actually building a target, you just specify which tool chain you want. It downloads, installs, and builds it for you. And uh, by default, we use code sorcery, but you can also have the option of using the Lenaro or Ubuntu cross tool chains or indeed the Android tool chain, which is what I used for the work I did for this talk. You can just specify it at the bottom like that or within your make, uh, make file itself, just specifying uh, your cross-arm tool chain. The targets that we currently support in this particular platform are uh, things like the Versatile Express and the Qualcomm MSM chip, as well as x86. Those are our major development platforms. However, in uh, preparing for these conferences and such, we decided to try and work out things on a, a number of different platforms, uh, things like the Raspberry Pi, Nexus 7, and the Galaxy S3 which was actually the development phone I uh, was trying to prepare the work for for this, uh, this talk, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We also maintain a build bot that uh, not only tests all of our code, but actually tests all of our patches against all the new uh, check-ins as they come in. So every time LVM, Clang, and the Linux kernel community check in new code, our build bot sits there, adds our patches, reruns all the test cases, the idea is to catch bugs as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and for instance, just this past week, one of the things that got my way was the dwarf changes that were just added to the latest LLVM backend in order to support x86 massively broke the uh, ARM compile. And so we had to basically patch those back out again until they actually fixed that. But those are the kinds of things that we can catch through the, our automated test cases that we run on a regular basis. Now, those of you who actually go and look at our build bot, you'll actually see we also run LTP tests on a nightly basis. However, they're all red right now, and they don't work, and it's because the SD card driver just broke. Didn't have time to fix it, so uh, a bit embarrassing, but uh, it's all working. It's just that 
our test image can't be loaded as the root file system, so I apologize. That's, I think, one of the first things I have to work out when I get back to my, uh, my home office. So indeed, if you guys want to uh, actually check out what, what, we, what we're doing and communicate with us, we've got a mailing list, we've got an IRC channel that we hang out on, uh, we've got developers across uh, three or four different continents, all in different time zones. Uh, there's usually somebody there to talk to and, and ask questions about. But now on to the, the real stuff, and that's basically the challenge is using Clang and LLVM to build things like the Linux kernel. And again, I concentrate primarily on the Linux kernel, so I'm going to talk about the Linux kernel and then applying that to the Android kernel. The challenges that we first have is, unlike GCC, where you actually have to build an, an entirely different tool chain per cross-compile target, right? ARM, Linux, GNU ABI, GCC. When it comes to Clang, it's a single tool, and then you just specify your host triplet, basically what you want to build for. So you just say Clang, target, you know, ARM, Linux, GNU ABI, and away you go. Unfortunately, what that means is, is that you don't necessarily know what triplet you need to use in a particular situation. So the first uh, challenge sometimes is figuring out what that happens to be. So Clang is very useful when it comes to cross-compiling, but there's a, a couple of things, if you're not familiar with it, that makes it a little bit harder. One of the great things about the toolkit for, uh, for LLVM is it actually includes an integrated assembler, or, or IA. And what that means is that the assembly is extremely fast because it's built right in. You're not actually forking off a different process and, and uh, sending uh, assembly code back and forth. The problem is, though, unfortunately, is, is that IA and the GNU as assembler are slightly different. They take slightly different uh, inline assembly code when it comes to uh, C itself. And as a result, when it comes to at least the Linux kernel, we actually couldn't use IA. We could use it in a number of situations, but there's a lot of inline assembly that's used in the, in the kernel that actually doesn't work with IA. So we actually had to turn it off. And actually, interestingly, um, the boot up code, of course, on x86 is 16-bit. IA only is, it's a 32-bit only assembler. So that kind of causes a lot of problems. So we actually have it turned off. We actually use the, the GNU um, assembler for that very reason until that kind of thing can be fixed. And then, it is a bug upstream in LLVM that people will, will eventually get to. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that we've still got a dependency on the GNU toolchain, and uh, specifically on the assembler and the linker. And in, until quite recently, it was a bit of a pain to, to set that up appropriately. Now we actually have an option called GCC toolchain. You just pass in that particular path, and it knows where to find those back end parts. The other kinds of things that, that we had, at least when it came to the, the kernel itself, is GCC and Clang have slightly different ideas as to what C standards ultimately get followed. GCC has always gone its own way and had extensions beyond what uh, is in the actual C standard because, quite frankly, people who use GCC tend to push the limits of what C can actually do. And so there's been some really great extensions in, in, uh, in GCC over the years. And in fact, there's the GNU 89 standard that that GCC defaults to, or, or usually defaults to. Clang, on the other hand, actually defaults to a later standard, to C99, and specifically the GNU99 extensions. And as a result, code that's been developed using GCC with GNU89 sometimes doesn't work entirely properly with GNU99 because the standard has changed somewhat. The other thing is, is that GNU99 is actually very, very close to the C99 standard, whereas GNU89 actually is quite different from the, from the uh, previous Seek uh, uh, standards. The other thing, quite frankly, is, is that a lot of companies that work on the Linux kernel also employ compiler writers. And sometimes they sit quite close together. And sometimes one guy says to the other, wouldn't it be great if the compiler guy says, no problems, I'll do it. And they toss the code over the, the, the uh, divider and it all works. The problem is, is it never gets documented. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we found that actually wasn't properly documented that's slowly being fixed, but it means ultimately that you get an option that was added specifically for the Linux kernel, but nobody really knows what it does except the people who originally added it. So that's been a bit of an issue as well. And then finally, there's, there are a number of uh, GCC flags that, uh, that are in there, again, that, that are specific to GCC that pretty much nobody else supports, including Clang as well as built-in functions. So built-in parts to the, the, uh, the actual compiler that, uh, that don't necessarily translate to other compilers. 
So I'm actually going to give a, a talk similar to this at uh, ELC, but just to go to, through the, uh, the kinds of issues that we had specifically really fast. Uh, the first one is that KBuild doesn't support Clang. It's highly GCC specific. Uh, again, there are options that are GCC specific that uh, Clang doesn't support. The other thing is, is that there are extensions that Clang cannot support and, and doesn't want to support. Things like variable length arrays and structs and things like nested functions. Both are, are actually ADA functionality that uh, leaked into the, into the C compiler. And uh, these are the kinds of things that we, we can't support. And variable length arrays are supported in the C standard. That as soon as you put them into a struct, the C standard actually explicitly forbids them. So as a result, Clang doesn't do them. Uh, they're, they're actually, uh, to implement, actually takes a lot of code and it actually makes your, your compiler a lot more complicated and actually slower, which is why they don't want to do it. The other problem we found is the uh, Linux kernel actually depends very heavily on the linker and different parts of how things are linked together. And what we found is, is that Clang actually has a couple of issues there. It links things a little bit differently. It means we actually get a lot of uh, segment reference issues where things in the code actually call across segments where they're not supposed to. So you get a lot of warnings around that. And the good thing is we actually just tracked down what the problem is. It turns out that the CP CPP portion of Clang is actually stripping out certain attributes that we rely on. So that's something we actually have to fix. We only just figured that out actually last week. Again, as I said before, assembly, uh, inline assembly is actually a little bit incompatible with IA. And then finally, there's actually built-in things like the built-in constant P. It's actually a built-in compiler function that tries to figure out whether a particular pointer is static. And from that, you can actually do a lot of uh, optimization of your code. Unfortunately, Clang, because of the way it's architected, actually can't implement that functionality. And so there's a couple of places where Linux uses this built-in function. We just have to patch around it. We don't actually have a solution for that one yet. So when it comes to actual where we are as far as the, the kernel is concerned, what we've actually managed to do is we've added patches so these are things that aren't necessarily upstream yet, uh, but we're working on it. First thing is we've added cable support for, uh, for Clang. We've added patches in that actually move us away from uh, the use of explicit register variable names in C back to using inline assembly. So unfortunately, uh, those explicit names like referring to the stack pointer directly, not supported in Clang. Uh, we have to remove the use of Blaze. Okay, variable length arrays and instructs are used heavily in the uh, crypto system, in NetFilter, and uh, a couple of other areas like the gadget code in USB. It's not something we compile, so it's a matter of recoding that. So we have some, some patches for that that we're trying to work upstream. Again, there's the segment link, linkage differences. And then there's the fact that extern inline actually has changed meaning between GNU 89 and, and uh, GNU 99. Again, GCC defaults to the GNU 89 behavior. So anywhere where extern inline is used, it actually has exactly the opposite meaning in the new standard. And so we actually had to mark those explicitly with, with attributes to tell Clang use the old meaning of it, not the new meaning. Again, built-in constants. Of, uh, we, have a, we basically patch out the use of uh, built-in constant. And, uh, and then finally, there's a, a couple of really crazy uh, uses of the, the aligned variable. Uh, that are really, really quite complex and hard to understand. GCC understands that particular use of the, of the, uh, of the aligned variable, and we basically just had to simplify it into two lines, and then Clang could do the same thing. But it's just the way it was parsed wasn't working in Clang, whereas uh, GCC could actually understand it. So we're actually at a point now where Clang itself is actually pretty, pretty good. Uh, most of our stuff's been upstreamed. There's actually still four patches that are specific to x86. Uh, but as far as ARM is concerned, the next version of Clang, Clang 3.3, will very likely work out of the box for, for uh, the Linux kernel. The only caveat to that, of course, is the, uh, the stripped uh, attributes that are coming in in uh, CPP. That's, like I said, a brand new problem that we still need to figure that out. So we're not, we're not sure how that's going to work, but we're really hoping we can get that into the next version as well. Uh, the most exciting thing about this is that the 64-bit uh, type handling wasn't actually supported by LLVM on ARM until quite recently. And uh, actually, uh, the Qualcomm Innovation Center actually just managed to get that code in. So they've been working over the last probably six months to take a really big patch. And it ultimately got uh, 
uh, cut down into a whole bunch of smaller patches and ultimately, like I said, it just got accepted upstream and it's now on by default. So on a 32-bit ARM, we can now do 64-bit type handling. And then of course the other thing is, is that uh, uh, we, can't, we still can't use the, the integrated assembler at this particular point in time. When it came to actual compiling Android itself, I, uh, I had access to a couple of different devices. Like I said, the, uh, the Samsung S3 and so on. And so we decided to use this particular phone with CyanogenMod just because it made things a whole lot simpler. So this is a phone that actually uses the Qualcomm MSM chipset, something we already had patches for. So it seemed like a good choice. So I uh, managed to get my hands on one of these. And uh, first thing I, I found, of course, is, is that it's not a developer phone. So the first thing I had to do was I actually had to, to root the phone. Uh, of course, when I, when I was doing that, I realized, okay, so there's no fast boot. Okay, so now what do I do? Right, so I had to find that uh, Samsung actually uses this thing called Odin mode. It allows you to download flash images only. Okay, well, I can get access to that, fair enough. I can put clockwork uh, mod recovery on there. That gives me more access to it, but it basically meant that I had to burn everything to flash whenever I wanted to do any testing. Now, there's actually a, uh, a Linux version. I actually, I actually had to, uh, to, to flash it uh, using Windows. But um, I actually found out later there's actually a tool called Heimdall. Somebody's reverse engineered the protocol, and you can now actually do the same sorts of things from Linux. But once I actually got to the point where I had a, a custom recovery image, at this point I could actually start making real changes to the, the, uh, the Android build that was on here and actually start uh, doing my real development. So I spent a couple of weeks on this. I started first with the, uh, the D2 ATT kernel from CyanogenMod 10.1, and it's, a, it's an older kernel. It's, um, I think it's 3.0.59 uh, is what I was playing with. Uh, so the first thing we did is we ported over the, uh, the LLVM Linux patches, and uh, I got some help from my, uh, my good friend uh, Mark Charlebois at uh, Qualcomm to help with that. Uh, we use our framework to actually build the LLVM Linux framework. So we actually have a new target called Galaxy S3 that, that allows you to build it. And then from that, because we, we did that actually, I should say, we did that because we had to use the newer Clang. And the Clang that's built into the uh, CyanogenMod mod is still the older version of, of Clang. It's version 3.1, whereas we're using the latest and greatest SVN version of, uh, of Clang. So we built it in our framework. We then installed it into the CyanogenMod mod build system build a boot image, install it with Clockwork Recovery Mod, or mod you know, through, uh, through uh, either the uh, SD card or, uh, or through uh, ADB, and reboot. And there's nothing that's more frustrating than having a phone in your hand that's basically buzzing every 10 seconds as it reboots over and over and over again. So the first thing we had, of course, is we didn't have fast boot. I can't see the console because it's, it's not up. So what do I do? So the nice thing is, of course, back to clockwork recovery mode. Of course, the great thing there is you can ADB shell in, and the really nice thing is that you have access to proc last K message. I didn't actually know that before, but uh, it means you can actually see what was coming up in D message before uh, the, the last time the kernel was running. So it's a bit of a slow debug, but basically it was a matter of build a kernel, uh, build a boot image, install it, reboot, have it fail, reboot back into recovery, ADB shell in, look at the D message, figure out what the problem was from the oops that was there, fix the code, and repeat. And uh, I did that for quite a while. In fact, I did that until the day before I got on the plane to come here. And the really, really great thing is, is that we've got a couple of different people on the project, and like probably the rest of you, they're one of those people that say, wouldn't it be cool if and one of our guys in Brazil actually said, wouldn't it be cool if it worked on my Nexus 7? So he actually did exactly the same thing. He went out and he uh, grabbed his Nexus 7. It's running an NVIDIA Tegra 3. So, and of course, it's, uh, it's a developer platform, so you can unlock the bootloader really easily with Fastboot. You know, absolutely no problems, completely supported. It's all good. Install Clockwork Mod Recovery at the same point. And in fact, this is work he did. I, I didn't actually do this. He was doing this while I was working on the Galaxy S3. And uh, again, he started with the grouper kernel from Masiana Gen Mod. He took my patches from ARM. He ported them over to, uh, to the, the kernel for, uh, for Android. At, 
Well, it took them a couple hours. It's, it's basically a matter of backporting those, those, those uh, patches from 3.8 back to 3.0. Uh, 3. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's not 3.0. I think they use 3.3. Uh, built it in the Linux kernel, installed it in CyanogenMod to build the boot image, and uh, he installed it using uh, Clockwork Recovery, and the damn thing booted first time. <laughs> so we were really happy about that. So the funny thing was is that the backup plan was actually for me to go out, and I actually bought this the day before, uh, spent my night installing his work. It worked. I next morning got up, got on the plane, and I'm here. So the nice thing is that I can actually now show you that on this particular platform, whoops. I can actually show you that if we ADB shell in here, if I catch, oops, You cat that file there in the proc file system. One of the nice things is Linux keeps metadata about how it was built. And if you look over to the right there, it says the name of the compiler that was used to build the kernel. In this case, you can see it was Clang version 3.3. Now, that's actually not the released version of 3.3 because, of course, we're not there yet. But you can actually see that, that we're actually running this uh, with Clang, a Clang built, uh, built kernel. And uh, the nice thing is, is that two of us have been running this on, on our uh, the Nexus 7s for a few days. I've had a couple of weird things happen, but in general, it's just worked. And we've been really, really happy about that. So um, again, it's one of those things where it's really nice to use a completely supported platform that uh, works out of the box. And although we didn't think we actually had support for Tegra 3 uh, in our, with our patches, it turns out that it was entirely trivial to get this working on here. When it came to the S3, the, the problems that we were actually having in this particular case uh, was we were having problems with the initRD not coming up properly. We were having problems with a couple of different of, of the, uh, the drivers that didn't work. And the last one that unfortunately I, I ran out of time to go any further on, turns out it's the sound driver. The sound driver was basically not coming up, which meant the sound system couldn't come up, which meant that Android rebooted. And so it's very, very frustrating, but there you go. That's, that was the problem we were having. So in parallel, I was actually working on a number of other, oops, let's really get rid of that. Okay, so in parallel, I was actually trying to spend as much time as I could on, on building Android itself with LLVM. And as you all know, and Android's a big code base. It has a lot of different moving parts and so on and so forth. Um, I tried to basically try and patch LLVM into the build process in probably some pretty naive ways. Okay, I didn't have a whole lot of time, and so I was trying to do this as fast as I possibly could. The first thing I tried was just, well, let's see if I just pass in CC variables. See how that works, right? So pass in cc equals clang, cxx equals clang plus plus, and you know, brunch d2 att because I was working on the uh, the s3, and away we go, right? No, it completely ignored it. It basically went back, used gcc, and a uh, bit of a failed experiment. But I was kind of hoping that would be the easiest way of doing it. The next thing I did was actually go into the make files themselves and start to replace the usage of how things work. Now, if you've uh, looked through the make files before, you'll, you'll see that, of course, in most cases, it's cc equals cross compiler gcc. It's the easiest way of doing it right. So in the case of a native compile, you're just using gcc. In the case of cross, you actually add the triplet to the beginning and away you go. Again, like I said before, though, Clang's a little bit different. You actually pass in Clang and then to target, you pass in the triplet without the trailing dash, right? So that's basically how to take off the trailing dash in, in uh, a make file. So I put that everywhere for, for target CC and uh, tried to build. The problem is, is that, again, a lot of these make files have been designed in such a way that the variables don't have spaces in them. And of course, there's two spaces in the CC variable now. And so all sorts of really bad shell errors popped up and everything else. And again, it was just taking too long to figure out how these things work. So my next approach was actually to write a, a wrapper script and just stick it in the path ahead of all those other compilers, right? And basically say, okay, well, I'm going to have a shell script. It's going to pretend that it's you know ARM, Linux, um, Android, GNU, EBI, a GCC, 
and then in the background, it's going to figure out what the triplet is based on the file name and then call clang appropriately. Sadly, the problem I had in this situation is, is that uh, the make files are very clever and they actually reset the path and call a lot of things directly by, by uh, full path name. And there was only so far I could go with this before I realized it wasn't going to work very well. So the very, very final thing that I was hoping to have time for but ended up spending a lot of time on the kernel was actually replacing all of the tools, all of the instances of GCC on the, on the file system with my wrapper scripts such that they were called explicitly. Unfortunately, that was something that was taking a lot more time than I had, than I had uh, because of the, uh, the Linux kernel. And, but but that, that's probably uh, how I will probably proceed now in order to get this stuff to work, at least initially. Because it's a matter of trying to get the code actually patched to work with LLVM before you can go any further. Overall, though, these are the kinds of, of uh, observation, observations rather I, I made based on the experience that we've had building the Linux kernel and so on. And uh, the first thing, of course, is, is that the build system for Android is relatively GCC-centric. That's not bad, it's just that's the way it was built, right? But that means that a new compiler coming in, if it has a different way of being invoked, that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, is that, again, you're back to uh, the use of, of options that don't necessarily uh, scan over to the other, other compiler. And although I didn't actually see these, these spe specific issues, I'm pretty sure those are probably also problems there. The other thing, of course, is again, you're back to the whole GNU 89 versus GNU 99 kind of situation. Again, had I actually got a little bit further, those were the kinds of problems I was expecting to have to start patching on a regular basis. And of course, the final thing is, is that since you're building the operating system itself, um, the big thing, of course, is, is that your C compiler has to be tied into the C library that you want to use when it comes to building Android, of course, you need to make sure that it's not using glibc, that it's using Bionic instead. So you can't just necessarily apt get install clang for your machine and start going. You have to use a clang that's been built specifically for Android, like the one in the NDK, although the NDK one, of course, is 3.1, and at least as far as the kernel is concerned, you need a much newer version of that. But those are the kinds of things that, that, I, that I was uh, hoping that would uh, basically make up for the fact that I wasn't able to actually get any further than I actually did. And I'd just like to leave you with one last thing, and that is basically who wouldn't want a, an Android with uh, dragon wings? Okay? Thank you very much for your time.